two out of five Canadians will develop cancer during their lifetimes. Over 1.6 million people have already died from AIDS-related illnesses this past year. With the current Ebola epidemic, the World Health Organization estimates that over 4,000 people have already died, and this number is still increasing. What do all of these statistics have in common? The fact that there are so many diseases in this world still without a cure, and something needs to be done about it. Did you know that it's already been over 5,000 years since the first description of cancer was discovered back in Egypt? And yet we still have not developed a cure to eradicate this disease. It's not a surprise, considering that there are over 200 different types of cancer, and the disease can affect anywhere in the body. But we can't give up. As a scientist, my job is to develop innovative strategies to try to improve global health care, to come up with solutions to address some of the challenges we face in life. One of the areas that my team is interested in working on is the development of what is known as nanomedicines. So when did this nanotechnology craze begin? When did the idea that smaller is better come about? It's believed to be linked to the development of the National Nanotechnology Initiative in the United States back in 2001. Ever since then, the United States government has invested over $20 billion towards the fabrication, the understanding, and application of nanotechnology to try to address some of the global issues we face. So what is nanotechnology? Well, nanotechnology is basically the fabrication design and application of materials in the nanoscale range. For example, in the computers and electronics industry, we try to develop products that are smaller, lighter, more portable, even more discreet. Some of these products include circuit boards, hard drives, even the iPod Nano. So what is nanomedicine then? So nanomedicine is the application of nanotechnology towards the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease. My research team is interested in developing what's known as nano-sized drug carriers. These nano-sized drug carriers can be made from a variety of different materials. Some can be natural, including starches and lipids. Some can be synthetic, such as polymers. Some can be inorganic, including gold. Some of you may have heard of these different nano-sized carrier systems, including liposomes, gold nanoshells, nanotubes, polymeric nanoparticles. So what is so fascinating about these nanoparticles? And how has it been used in cancer therapy, for example? Before I get to that, do you guys know how big a nanoparticle truly is? I want everyone here to pull up one strand of hair. If you don't have any, feel free to pull one from the person sitting next to you. I'm just kidding. As you can see here, a human strand of hair is approximately 60 to 120 microns wide. That's approximately 1,000 times larger than a single nanoparticle. So that's how small these nanoparticles truly are. Now, why are we developing these nanoparticles, particularly for applications of medicine? What are the benefits? What are the advantages? First of all, nanoparticles are so small, they can easily enter cells within our body. This is beneficial for specific types of cell-targeted therapy. Nanoparticles can also protect drug from degradation. For example, if you were to swallow a drug right now, by the time it reaches your stomach, majority of that drug may have either broken down or become degraded. These nanoparticles can act like a shield to protect the drug from our acidic stomach environment. Other scientists have also developed nanoparticles to assist in penetrating biological barriers. For example, if you want to deliver drugs to the brain, you're going to develop nanoparticles to help penetrate the blood-brain barrier. If you want to deliver drugs transdermally, you can develop nanoparticles to penetrate the outer layer of our skin. So how has nanomedicine been applied to cancer therapy? Well, the widest application of nanoparticles is for what's known as targeted drug delivery. If you know, most cancer patients, when they're undergoing chemotherapy, they tend to lose their hair. 
The reason for this is because these chemotherapeutic drugs are so toxic, they can not only affect, but they can also kill normal healthy cells, including your hair follicles. Now, target drug ther uh, therapy, what we try to do is we try to design these nanoparticles so that they will recognize specific markers on cancer cells and deliver the drugs in high concentrations to these cancer cells, but not to the normal healthy cells. Ultimately, our goal is to reduce toxicity while improving therapeutic efficacy. My team has developed nanoparticles for applications in imaging tumors. We have encapsulated fluorescently labeled genes within these nanoparticles. As you can see in panel B, after we injected our animals with these nanoparticles, there's a bright red fluorescent color within the abdomen of the animals. The reason is because these nanoparticles are accumulating at the site of the tumors. On pa in panel A, these animals do not have any cancer or tumor development. And after we inject it with the same nanoparticle formulation, as you can see, there's an absence in the red color. We have also used our nanoparticles as a strategy for reducing tumor growth, tumor volume. In panel C, as you can see here, the tumors are quite large and quite dense according to the heat map that you see on the right-hand side. But after we treated these animals with our nanoparticle formulation, you can see a significant reduction in size of the tumor as well as the density. So, to date, we have several nanomedicines that have been approved for human use. Some have been approved for fungal applications, some have been approved for the treatment of hepatitis B, and some have also been used for cancer therapy. Another example of using nanoparticles for cancer therapy include the fact that, for example, we can design these nanoparticles to be stimuli responsive. For example, after you inject into a patient, we can expose the site of where the cancers are actually uh, present to heat or ultrasound, causing drug to be released only at that site. So after several decades of research, why do we only have a handful of nanomedicines? The reason is because of safety. So as I mentioned earlier, nanoparticles can be made from a variety of different materials, including synthetic, um, <clears throat> natural, even inorganic. So when you have such a wide variety of different materials that you work with, it's hard to standardize how to evaluate safety of these nanoparticles. To further complicate things, even if we use the same material, but we change the size or even the shape, that alone can already have an altered physiological effect. Other issues that we need to be concerned about include social and ethical issues. The term nanomedicine already sounds expensive. If that's the case, how can we get these products out in a global scale, particularly in developing countries? What if I develop nanoparticles illegally in conjunction with performance-enhancing drugs? As I mentioned earlier, we can design these nanoparticles to target specific cell types. So if I wanted my nanoparticles to direct the performance-enhancing drugs specifically to muscle cells, that means less of it's going to be in the blood, less is going to be in the urine, that means it won't be detected by regulatory officials. I want to ask you this question. How much longer do we have to wait before we can develop a nanomedicine that can entirely eradicate cancer? How much longer do we have to wait before we can develop a nanomedicine that can protect us from HIV infection or even Ebola? So is nanomedicine truly able to improve global health care, improve the lives of people, or is it nothing more than a buzzword? Thank you.